It's now time to introduce our special guest. We're thrilled to have with us tonight Liv Baker, PhD. Dr. Liv Baker is a conservation behaviorist and an expert in wild animal welfare. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Liv Baker. So why compassionate conservation? That's something that I'll be sort of elaborating on during this talk. It also, asking this question gives me an opportunity to show what I think is this amazing illustration by a friend and an artist in New York, Joseph Smolinski. And he, he drew this, he illustrated this after a long conversation about how do we make a place for other animals in our world. So not just giving them space, but welcoming them into what we perceive as our homes and understanding that it's their homes as well. So I think this is just a beautiful illustration and, and illustrates my belief in what co compassionate conservation is attempting to strive at. So this is a quotation, and this audience you may have heard of, and you may have read, you may have actually read the book, but I think it's, even if you've come across this quotation, read the book, it's always a good reminder, and I'm going to take the time to read this. So this is, from, this is by um, Henry Beston. From, uh, he's an American naturalist. He lived a long time on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and this is from his, um, the book he wrote, The Outermost House, from 1928. And he writes, remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, man in civilization surveys the creature through the glass of his knowledge and sees thereby a feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. We patronize them for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate, for having taken form so far from ourselves, and therein do we err. For the animal shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with the extension of the senses we have lost or never attained. Living by voices, we shall never hear. They are not brethren. They are not underlings. They are other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and the travail of earth. And so this is something I'd like us to keep in mind along with Joseph's illustration as I move forward in tonight's talk. So part of com compassionate conservation is rethinking the science of saving animals. And I'll talk about why it's so urgent that we are rethinking this. I want to talk about the core principles of compassionate conservation. So there's a bit of a, maybe a little history lesson for all of us. Um, so what compassionate conservation embodies? One is help or do no harm. So similar to the Hippocratic Oath that medical doctors would undertake as they move into their practice. So compassionate conservation for most practitioners believe that all harms to non-human animals caused by humans should be prevented regardless of human intention. So to really understand impact over intention. And prevention of harm is often disregarded in decision making in conservation. Another core principle is that individuals matter. Individuals should be valued in their own right, not just as units of populations and species. And often in conservation, and historically this is true, they have been disregarded in decision making and in the science of conservation. And this is despite understanding that individuals provide behavioral, social, and also cultural stability in their environments. A third core principle is good labels or no labels. So the labels that have been used historically in conservation, wildlife management, etc., to categorize animals often belie their intrinsic value and, as a result, affect the way we consider them. So we suggest that labels should be removed in decision making so we actually understand what's at play rather than bring our biases forward. And the fourth core principle is nonviolent coexistence. So that humans should strive for behaviors that promote the sharing of space, the making of place, the welcoming of other animals, and also respect for wildness. And we understand that unwillingness to do this drives a lot of conflict and harm in our world. So compassionate conservation 
is now a fairly well-established academic and applied discipline. If you do a Google Scholar search, if you go to a database, Web of Science, etc., you'll see hundreds of articles that reference compassionate conservation at this point. These are just a few of them. I am log rolling a bit. I have a couple of my own listed up there, right? So why individuals matter, lessons in animal welfare and conservation, translocation biology, the clear case for compassionate conservation, compassion as a practical and evolved ethic for conservation, ethics and responsibility in wildlife tourism, lessons from compassionate conservation in the Anthropocene, that's our age of humans, compassionate conservation, rehabilitation, and translocation of Indonesian slow lorises, promoting predators, and compassionate conservation. So again, this is just a smattering of the examples of the scientific um, body of literature that's out there that's speaking to this. Compassionate conservation is also readily found in the news. So here, this is early on from um, in 2010, actually. So this is showing Camilla Fox. Some of you in this world might know of her. She is the head and co-founder of Project Coyote. So she's a major proponent of protecting coyotes, looking for predator-friendly farming, etc. And here she is with Virginia McKenna. Again, some of you may know her. She helped found the Born Free Foundation in the UK. There's a, a contingent in the US as well. So they're speaking on compassionate conservation and trying to bridge what was known as this divide between animal welfare and conservation. And I'll speak more to that later. Here's an article in Forbes. So this is Dr. Mark Beckoff. So again, a name some of you may know about. He's been a major champion of compassionate conservation, really spreading the word around the world. This is a discussion with him. Here's another article um, by Matt Chu. Matt Chu is an ecologist speaking on what is compassionate conservation. He's a bit of a convert, and he's done a bit of invasion biology, and compassionate conservation has really started to help him rethink past conceptions about that. This is from Yale Environment. This is from the Forestry School at Yale University. Do, and this is from 2018. Do conservation strategies need to be more con Passionate. So again, compassionate conservation is a buzz and buzzing around. We've also had three international conferences. The first one was at the University of Oxford, hosted in part by the Born Free Foundation. This was in 2010. So this is Joyce Poole, who's very famous for her work with elephants. Example of one of the talks is Elephants on the Edge, the Use and Abuse of Individuals and Societies. The second international conference was at the University of British Columbia in Canada in 2015. The third international conference was at the University of Technology Sydney in Australia that brought together a wide variety of people. There was a, a regional conference in Israel, so this is Compassionate Conservation Middle East. Their 2018 conference was Compassionate Conservation Middle East Coexistence with Wildlife. And we are planning our upcoming Compassionate Conservation Conference for Banff, Alberta, hoping, aiming for summer 2020. So if you're interested, please keep a lookout for that. Okay, so back to Compassion, or onwards um, and upwards about compassionate conservation. So why this urgency for rethinking the science of saving animals? And here's another quotation. Part of it is we have a very different conception and understanding of wilderness. So here is um, part of the Wilderness Act of 1964, written by Howard Zeneisner from the Wilderness Society. It was actually, the Wilderness, Wilderness Act came into law in 1964, the year he died, even though he was working on this act for nearly a decade. And he writes, A wilderness, in contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape, is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. This would be lovely, and it would have been lovely if we could have followed through on this, but this, this notion of wilderness, right, as a notion, as reality doesn't exist. All, 
all walks of life, all parts of the planet are trammeled by humans in some way. All wildlife is impacted, right? And we are currently in an extinction crisis. Our world is in crisis. Hence, this urgency for rethinking the science of saving not just animals, but saving the planet for ourselves as well. Here are some of the impacts that humans have on the planet. Urban sprawl, suburban development, the sheer number of cars in traffic, the pollution from that, the reworking and rerouting of waterways through major dams, the destruction of habitat through major deforestation, uh, desertification that happens, major agriculture and the runoff and the pollution that results from that along with the habitat loss and degradation, the over-harvesting, etc. So this leads to inadvertent, maybe not deliberate, but leads to harm and to greater human-wildlife interaction and wildlife conflict. So this is something we can't ignore, right? So these parts of these, some of these animals are in areas of the world we might think of as wilderness or having vast amounts of wilderness, but this is still what occurs. So let's think about threats to species survival and biodiversity, right? As I mentioned in that other slide, we have vast tracts of forest and habitat destroyed, removed, completely lost. Coral reefs, habitats, ecosystems such as this destroyed due to pollution, overuse, global climate change, major over-harvesting, major over-exploitation. Part of why I use the pika is because they're really adorable, but they've been also used as the symbol of climate change and the types of animals, the types of species that are losing to it. So they're mountainous, they're mountainous species, and they prefer colder climates. And as the global temperatures have warmed up, they've moved, they've migrated, they've, they've attempted to move up the mountains. Well, those areas, those habitats are, are very rapidly declining and disappearing. So species such as this are going to go with it. Here's a eucalypt forest you'd see in Australia. Maybe some of you have traveled and visited um, such a habitat, such an ecosystem. So what is a species that we might think of, an animal species, when we think of the eucalypt forest? What's that? Koala. Koala. Yes, good. You came through for me, Carol. Right? So here is a resting or slumbering koala at home in a eucalypt forest. Well, eucalypt forests are one of the, the types of habitat that's, that's destroyed, that's deforested in these areas. And so this is not uncommon. You remove that habitat, you impact these animals, these individuals that rely on it for their home. And what are they to do? The other thing to think about is a eucalypt forest isn't home just to koala, right? We see rock wallabies that also make their home there, gray-headed foxes, make their homes there, the brush turkey, kookaburras, a lace monitor, stone geckos, yellow-faced whip snake, burrowing toads, and graceful tree frogs. Right? So maybe these are, we, Carol came through for me, and this is true, that most of us do associate koalas, a charismatic, adorable, animal with the eucalypt forest, but it's also home to many, many other species that are dependent on that and then are impacted by the loss of that home. Thinking about conservation practice and policy, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, is trying to parse intention versus impact. We can be as well-intentioned as we want, but we can still have really negative impact on others in the world. And that brings me to thinking about conservation interventions in the name of protection of nature, protection of other species, etc. So some of these interventions are about ecosystem management, such as prescribed burns, such as plant removal, fertility control. So we have the kangaroos on the left, pigeons on the right. 
captive breeding program, so adorable Vancouver Island marmots and very young, can you guess what's on the right? Who said that? Yeah, panda bears, very good, right? And often I'll just note that a lot of the captive breeding programs are about just producing numbers, not about releasing back into the wild. And then relocations. And so relocation, so moving animals from one place to another, maybe from a captive breeding program out into the wild, maybe from a, a wild area to another area, hopefully protected. These types of relocations, movements of animals are part of the recovery, the species recovery program for most, if not all, threatened species around the world. So thousands of them, hundreds of them occur yearly. And the picture on the right, to even to indicate my complicity in this, in, in terms of trying to parse intention versus impact, the picture on the right is one I took of the kangaroo rat that I helped um, translocate. And I say complicity because we're not always sure about the success of these translocations and these reintroductions. Barriers are another type of major intervention, so exclusions, fences in some way. So we have some trying to keep in, keep out um, elephants on the left. The right is just showing fence going up in Australia. And again, the impact that this might have, that's a kangaroo that was snared up in that fence. And it's a common sight that we see in areas where fences are not maintained. And most of the time, these barriers aren't well maintained. And then culling. So the killing of large numbers of animals, this is a major practice in conservation and wildlife management. We see this for all sorts of different species. So on the left is a deer cull that was happening. On the right was a, a coyote harvest. So again, these are very common. The other thing about conservation is it defines winners and losers or it has historically defined winners and losers. So it could be about favoring one species over another. So on the left is a Vancouver Island marmot found in um, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. It's endangered. And on the right is a golden eagle. In the name of protecting the Vancouver Island marmot that is largely endangered because of deforestation, loss of habitat due to humans, and then the logging roads that are made up towards their habitat, allowing for then predators to more easily get to the, the marmots. Instead of redressing that, well, let's kill one of their predators, so killing golden eagles. There was a bit of outrage about this, but the, po the practice did go through for a period of time. Another one is, does anybody know any birders any, on the right? Any, what's that? Spotted owl and the barred owl. Maybe I heard it. So we have barred owl and the spotted owl. The barred owl is because it has the ability of flight to move from the east to the western part of the contiguous United States, it is now considered invasive as it enters spotted owl habitat. So the policy has been let us kill now these barred owls that are quote-unquote invasive by their sheer ability to fly across the country. The other thing conservation has historic in, in, in defining winners and losers is that we privilege human interest, whether it be let's build this road through known habitat, migratory areas, etc., or in the case of the Canada geese, there's just a lot of poop on our public parks and we don't like it. There are just too many. We're uncomfortable. Let's kill them. And so these Canada geese are rounded up to, for those reasons. They're just too many, and I don't want to step on their poop. In addition to defining winners and losers is these categories. Killing large numbers that are deemed often arbitrary, often without any scientific backing, and also quite varying. Killing animals that are deemed non-native, common, abundant, pest, nuisance, varmint. And so how an animal is labeled can change from season to season. It could be the exact same species, but it might change from season to season for the benefit of a particular municipality, right? It might change from one town to another, from one state to another, etc. 
And so by giving these species these labels, such as non-native, invasive, pest, etc., not surprisingly, if you understand human behavior and human nature, it makes it easier to treat them more inhumanely. So if you vilify, we can treat them worse and uh, we feel less guilty about it. So again, thinking about the urgency for rethinking the science behind conservation. This is a quote from a paper back in 2010 by two wildlife ecologists. And they write, the same human activities driving the current extinction crisis are also causing suffering, fear, physical injury, psychological trauma, and disease in wild animals. So this, if you remember from that earlier slide, Virginia McKenna, is this idea of bridging conservation and animal welfare science. Understanding that impacts to the environment sort of at larger levels, at larger scales, are also impacting the environment at the level of individual, at the level of family, et cetera. The other thing we're finding out is that there's been a major inappropriate use of science. It's, there's been an, or a poor interpretation of scientific data and then poorly applied. We also see a frequent disconnect between the science that we understand, the science we know, and in the application to policy and practice. Oftentimes, the science isn't comprehensive enough to actually develop a, a real conservation plan. And so as a result, it doesn't lead to alternative scientific questions. It doesn't lead us to funding certain alternative research. And it hasn't led us to actually, or at least not until compassionate conservation was developed, it hasn't, hadn't led us to really ask these questions, these alternative questions, to, to, put, to question the status quo. And the problem is we're working with entrenched paradigms, right? Humans don't like change. Humans don't like to question what we're comfortable with. We don't like overall what's not familiar. And this is true of scientists. It's true of practitioners overall and of the community. And so it takes time for, to affect change. So we see that anthropocentric values, human values, dominate decision making. And overall, there is little time and regard given to trying to understand how we can make a place for these other animals living in our world that find this world their home as well. Again, a little bit of a history lesson, thinking about whose conservation are we talking about. In the 60s and 70s, we were talking more about nature for itself. So this is when that notion of wilderness that was described from the Wilderness Act of 1964 was still in people's minds, that we could somehow, that that wilderness existed, this untrammeled area, that that existed so that we could just, and that humans were separate from nature. We can just cordon off these pristine areas, if pristine even existed, and protect them. Well, that, that doesn't exist, as I mentioned before. In the 80s and 90s, it came to, with the advent of really understanding climate change, global warming, etc., there was a bit of a real reaction. So thinking about nature despite people. So really coming to grips with this extinction crisis, the major threats, the pollution, the major habitat loss, habitat fragmentation that we were seeing. And then in the early aughts, in the 2000s, we were thinking about nature for people, nature in the service of people. So terminology such as ecosystem services, et cetera, came around. Thinking about natural resources, right, in the service of humans. Now we're in an area where we're trying to think about people and nature, people as part of this world. So thinking about the resilience of the world, that environments change, that there are socio-ecological systems, that humans shouldn't be present. So again, how to make a place for other animals as well as ourselves. So thinking about people in nature, right, making this place is really difficult. Thinking, and these are just some of the satellite issues that feed into this. So the cognitive dissonance that we all live with to some degree. The emotional distance that we form when it's our outgroup in some way. The biases that we bring to 
this discourse, right? The idea that we may or may not want to share our own space, the socioeconomic situation that exists, the entrenched thinking that's in conservation science, et cetera. And I'm sure you can think of many more issues and factors that would feed into, into this. So just another opportunity to show this beautiful illustration. So again, why compassionate conservation? Why this, we, I'm trying to make this case for this urgency for rethinking. So we, people got together and literally we sat around a table to try and think of a way to bring this together, to br bring our understanding about not just the ethical understanding that individuals matter, that other animals matter, that this is their home as well, that these animals and their homes are impacted by our behavior, whether deliberate, whether intended or unintended, etc. And that also the science behind conservation is flawed and isn't, and isn't actually achieving many of the conservation goals that it sets out. So conservation really developed, the, the field of conservation bi biology developed through the concern for the loss of wilderness. So moving from that notion of protection of wilderness into thinking nature dis despite people, right? So it's a mission-oriented field to react to the crises that were presented with. And as a result, it's really focused on populations, these larger collectives. It's focus, focused on populations, on species, overall ecosystem biodiversity, ecosystem health. And it explicitly has not focused on welfare of individual. In a really seminal paper by Michael Soule in 1986, he explicitly says animal welfare, because he conflated animal welfare science with animal rights, he explicitly said animal welfare science has no part in conservation. Veterinary medicine is okay, but animal welfare science, no. That's merely political. He was wrong, and he's admitted that in more recent years. Animal welfare science as a discipline and practice, on the other hand, has focused on individuals, but historically, animals under direct human care and management. So this has meant companion animals, animals used in food production, used in science, used in entertainment, and of the wild animals, it's mainly been concerned with consumptive activities, so hunting and trapping. So animal welfare science hasn't really thought about the welfare and well-being of free-living wild animals. Animal welfare science has developed the five freedoms. This largely came from the farm animal world. Has anybody heard of the five freedoms here? No? So this was, this came in the, the 50s and 60s. This was freedom from negative states. So freedom from thirst, freedom from hunger, freedom from malnutrition, freedom from discomfort and, and overexposure, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, freedom from fear and distress, and the freedom to express normal behavior. So again, coming from the farm world, okay? So again, about freedom from negative states. Then there was a development of something called the five domains. This is from David Meller's work. Um, he's in New Zealand, where, where it starts to think about welfare status, including mental state. So beyond just these freedom from negative states, but thinking about nutrition, which would be part of the five freedoms, environment, overall health, again, part of the five freedoms, but also behavior feeding into mental state. So a big deal. Now we're thinking about, beyond just five domains, thinking about a, white, a life worth living. What is well-being, right? Thinking about not just mental state, but emotional state, psychological state. And so what are some of the things that feed into that? And this is true, this is where we can rely on our embodied knowledge because it's true for us as well. Thinking about nutrition, environment, physical health, a sense of agency, that availability to access positive challenges and having control over one's life, the ability to make choices, right? So not just about freedom from negative states, but 
what, but on the flip side, what, what feeds into our positive state of well-being? And so conservation biology and practice was really lean towards, again, these larger collectives, populations, ecological systems, and genetic types. So when we originally sat around the table, we, how do we bring animal welfare science to the table of conservation biology? How do we get the world of conservation to understand that individuals matter, not just matter in, for intrinsic value, and, but actually matter to the health of their populations, to their environments? And so we tried to then shift things over by considering, adding to the consideration, individuals and social groups. But compassionate conservation really seeks to be greater than the sum of its parts. Not just application of animal welfare science to conservation, but something else entirely. And it's something I call eco-ecological success. Right? So the idea that you have an ethical basis to your conservation and that feeds directly into the ecological success of your conservation efforts. So that the health of species, populations, ecosystems, understanding genetic diversity, understanding individuals, caring about individuals, considering their families, considering who their neighbors are, and also understanding culture in other animals matters to this eco-ecological success. For the well-being of free-living wild animals, and this is true not just for free-living wild animals, this is true for all other animals, other, including ourselves, that other animals want appropriate shelter, safety, nutrition. Animals want to learn about and hold sway over their lives. They want that control. They want that freedom, freedom the ability to make choices. That physical health is intertwined with psychological health. Their social environment matters. And that reasonable challenges and positive, positive emotions are necessary to their well-being and are integral to their lives. So here is a quotation by Marion Dawkins, who's a famous um, cognitive scientist and animal welfare scientist. Any formulation of what, what is meant by animal welfare, and I'm going to push our envelope to actually mean well-being, has to take into account both the long-term needs and the short-term wants that have evolved in wild animals and are still the legacy of captive ones. And this is a really important idea and something that factors greatly into our work with the rewilded Asian elephants when I come to speak about that. So if we think about wild animal well-being along this continuum that can go in any direction, that the goal is this life worth living. That's true for us too, right? That we want a life worth living. Beneath that is this ability to strive, that we have opportunity to reach that life worth living. Subordinate to that is subsistence, that we're eking out a life, we're getting by. Below that is a life worth avoiding. It's difficult enough, right, that we and other animals don't want it. And then when we hit rock bottom and others, and maybe there are some animals that learn to be helpless, right, become depressed, and this happens, experience post-traumatic stress disorder from the trauma in their lives. They've entered into a state of a life not worth living, right? So where to try and understand for these animals that are impacted by human behavior, by human action, whether deliberate, whether inadvertent, etc., where are they? And can we, do, is there opportunity to pull them if they're not at a life worth living, can we pull them towards that? So I want to talk about some compassionate conservation in action. So one of the things about compassionate conservation is to ask questions that other people in conservation science haven't asked before, and that's to challenge conventional methodology. So hot iron branding is really common in for marine mammals to identify them. So you haul them out, you hot iron a brand, and you brand them. 
and then you, in most cases, they're released back into the waters and used for tracking. And the goal is to understand, to track them so you can understand what their numbers are, the health of the population, etc. Very little thought in the past is given to the fact that you've just branded an animal. Could this have impact on their behavior, their health, etc.? And so, and this is true for other types of monitoring. So there's, um, I don't know if you can read it, the, the paper by Zoe Jewell out of Duke, she writes, the effective monitoring technique on quality of conservation science. To actually question, we, we t again, intention versus impact. Yes, let's monitor them. Let's see how they're doing. Well, does our monitoring techniques actually have a negative impact on these animals, not just in the short term, but in the long term? And so she spent a lot of time looking at this, looking at the, va the validity of this science. And so did um, Kristen Walker, um, who, who looked at this practice of hot iron branding and said, hey, wait a minute. Has anyone asked to see if this is problematic, if this is dangerous, if the, the science that, be, that we're getting is even valid based on these practices? They also do abdominal pit tagging as well. So again, looking at and just challenging conventional methodology is part of compassionate conservation. Thinking about individuals, right? So here's again a little bit of log rolling um, for, for some of the work that I've done. So these translocations, hundreds, thousands of them that occur throughout the world on a yearly basis, most of them are highly unsuccessful. It wouldn't be weird or odd or uncommon for 60% of the animals, 95% of the animals you release, endangered animals, to die within the first few days to weeks of your release. Right? So to question the methodology and to understand, well, maybe individual differences matter in how they are able to cope with these highly stressful situations of releasing animals into wholly new habitat, habitat that they have never seen before, habitat that they know nothing about. And like you and I, we all cope differently with change and with novel situations. And that's true for other animals as well. And in my work and work similar to this, we see that animals with different personality that actually affects your ability to survive these types of events. Wildlife re re rehabilitation, so again, thinking about individuals is really important. So wildlife rehabilitation has been historically disregarded by conservation science because, again, it's, fo it's focused on the individual, not about these larger collectives, but wildlife re rehabilitation really needs its due in conservation science. It needs to be spotlighted for the work that it does because it values the individual as much as it values the species. And it really looks at supporting disadvantaged animals. And we're finding, again, this, this notion of wilderness doesn't exist. All animals, all habitat is impacted in some way, disadvantaged to varying degrees, and wildlife rehabilitators and the practice of wildlife rehabilitation is really important to helping to redress this. So here's some work um, done in India that has rehabilitated tigers, rhinos, elephants, clouded leopards, a whole range of other species, in the hopes of, with the intent of releasing them back into the wild. Compassionate conservation also, a major part of it, is to challenge these lethal measures that are so common in conservation and wildlife management. So looking at these non-lethal alternatives. So questioning the ethics, the efficacy of lethal methods used to control species. So immunocontraceptives are one way of doing that. Those are not without its problems, but they've gotten a lot better at developing these immunocontraceptives. Also challenging lethal measures is looking at guardian dogs and guardian animals. Predators are hugely persecuted throughout the world, largely in ranching communities. So coyotes, wolves, bobcat, cougars, right, are killed uh, with vast, uh, in vast numbers. Um, so to try and reduce the persecution of these animals, and, and I'll mention thinking about how these predators actually have major positive impact on the health of the ecosystems, guardian dogs have been implemented in a lot of these ranching communities. I include this photo 
in the lower right to show, again, not without impact to the dogs. So this was in the news recently. I don't know if anybody saw it. This was a dog that survived after protecting um, his, his charges from a wolf attack. But the papers that have come out have shown that hundreds of predators have not been killed as a result of these guardian dogs. Another thing is um, for compassionate conservation and action, action is challenging the roles, um, the historical roles of zoos and animals in captivity. The example I want to give here is from the Detroit Zoo. So back in 2004, the um, director of the Detroit Zoo, Ron Kagan, made the decision, and this went against the, the entire zoo community, not just within the United States, but worldwide, to say, we don't have the facilities, we don't have the environment, we should not hold these elephants in captivity. And he sent them to a sanctuary and diverted resources instead to protecting elephants in their native habitat. So this was a major challenge. He endured a lot of flack from the zoo community as a result of this, but he stuck to his guns. The other thing about compassionate conservation is that we challenge this notion of nativeness and what is biodiversity. So to really understand, so this is rethinking the science. So this is to understand invasive impact versus actually you're trying to understand ecological function. So I've included a series of pictures in here from work. These photos were taken by Arian Wallach. I think most of them were from her work in um, Arizona and in Australia. So camels, do you know where wild camels exist? What's that? No. They, they, what's that? Wild, free living camels. Anybody know? What's that? Australia. It's pretty much the only place that there are free-living wild camels. They are killed and culled there because they're considered non-native, in some cases a pest. And the picture on the right is showing feral donkeys, burrows, in Arizona in the southwest. Again, pest, non-native. With the thinking of challenging conventional notions, challenging the science that isn't, people started to look at, well, what is the ecological function? Forget these labels, but let's actually look at the ecological function of these animals. And they are having positive ecological impact in their environments. One of the ways they're doing that is through their movement, their footfalls, they are creating areas for water to capture, for seeds to sow, for plants to grow. So they're repopulating arid regions with new plants. They're providing wa water sources for other animals, etc. Right? So something we didn't even think to look at because they were just deemed non-native. They were deemed pest. Let's not look at their place in this environment. Understanding trophic cascades is another way that compassionate conservation challenges conventional thought and an attempt to restore wildness. And so restoring apex predators to their environment has a major way of stabilizing the environment and in places where there are quote unquote livestock, I don't like that term, um, animal used for food, right? We find that if you stabilize the environment with apex predators, that there's actually fewer predation attempts on these animals. So this is example is from Dingo Biodiversity Project, again, with Erin Wallach's work. Also rewilding, so restoring wildness. And this is where I'm going to transition into talking about the uh, rewilding of the Asian elephants and the work I do with Mahout's Elephant Foundation and Carol and Victoria had an opportunity to be a part of. So this is something I call the compassionate three R's, rescue, rehabilitation, and rewilding. So thinking about a new way of conservation in this age of humans, in this Anthropocene. So if we think about captivity and these animals in captivity, billions of them endure various levels of impoverished lives in zoo, aquaria, circuses, tourist sites around the world. And often the drive for this, these captive animals drives these free-living animals, their populations, to the brink of existence. And the Asian elephant is a case in point. 
In Thailand, there are more captive Asian elephants than there are wild elephants. So this is not uncommon for the lives of these captive elephants, whether they have their tusks shorn, their ears and the base of their chunks worn from overuse, the, the fact that they are chained um, to posts on concrete, for hours upon a day, and that's if they're not performing on behalf of the tourists. So here's an elephant that has been trained to paint. There's no joy in this for this elephant. Or they're asked to do these unsightly tasks and postures for, for the tourists. Or they're, they're trekking the tourists throughout throughout particular forests. And this is real insult to injury because they're carrying these tourists through their habitat. They're going through native habitat with natural forage that they cannot stop to eat, right? So they're kept chained when they're not performing, when they're not working, and then when they do go through their habitat, they can't even access it. So the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, has specific priorities set out for the protection and conservation of Asian elephants. One is habitat conservation and cognitivity, management of human-elephant conflict, and also improve legislation and enforcement to deter poaching, trade in elephant product, products, etc. But very little is given to the elephants in captivity. They're almost as if they're not part of the species anymore. And so I ask, have they been dispossessed? Have these elephants been dispossessed of their species status? Are they no longer part of Elephants Maximus? And so there have been major conservation failures. One is that we react over act a lot, that we favor categories over understanding the importance of individuals, both from an ethical and a scientific and practical standpoint, and we actually, conservation, as a practice, what I think they do, historically, conventionally, and as someone who identifies as a conservation behaviorist, is we actually preserve over conserve. So we actually look for maintaining status quo as opposed to understanding how dynamic animals are, how dynamic their environments are, etc. So with rescue, rehabilitation, and rewilding, this is looking to redress and progress conservation practices. So this is in northern Thailand. This is some of what the habitat looks like in this area, this beautiful native forest. Another picture of that, if you can see. We also work with local villagers. These are Karen people. They're indigenous to parts of Thailand. They technically own these Asian elephants. They oftentimes rent their Asian elephants to tourist camps to make money. Oftentimes that's the sole source of income for many of these families. But many of these families who own the Asian elephants are also interested in maintaining their own, maintaining the forest in which their village lives, in which they live, in which they subsist on, maintaining the ability to live in these villages and not have to go into the cities, and also the fact that they want their elephants to be, many of them want their elephants to be in the forest and not in the camps. This is a picture of Tonkam. She's the one who has the person on her um, on the left, and her daughter Bifern on the right. And so Tonkam worked in the camps for a while. This is Tonkam now, or maybe a couple of years ago, now that she's returned entirely and for the rest of her life to native forest. So she no longer is at the beck and call of other tourists and along the timeline of other tourists and other people. She spends her days and her nights in native forest in northern Thailand. And you can see her, just the condition of her skin how that's changed, looking at the wear and the injury on her ears, the base of her trunk, the color of that pigmentation, and how rich and beautiful, more beautiful, she is now. And here we see her in the forest as well. So here's a picture of Tonkam leading her family away from the river. This is a really amazing photograph because what it shows is 
This is after Tonkam and her family were trekked, they walked from the elephant camps over a week, hundreds of kilometers back to the forest. So this is their return home. And this is what Mehut's Elephant Foundation spent a long time putting a lot of resources into developing this program to return these elephants home, to return Tonkam and her, and her family back to the forest. So they trekked with these elephants over a week, hundreds of kilometers to the forest. And on the first day there, she brought them down. They, they were brought down actually by the Mahouts to the, to the river to clean, to bathe, to drink. And then it was Tonkam's decision, nobody else's, and she said, she gave a call, she gave a signal, and she said to her family, let's go. They, they followed suit, and of her own choice, her own volition, she moved back up the mountain. And she's been making those decisions ever since. Here's the family again. We have Tonkam, Sunti, her son, who was born in the forest, will know nothing but the forest, and Mario on the right. I told my husband, Adrian, that I would leave him for Mario, he's so beautiful and lovely. <laughs> Here's Mario. Mario is an amazing and sensitive soul. And I just want to show this video of him. And for many of you, this will seem like familiar behavior if you know about zoo elephants, right? So he is actually displaying that what we understand is that stereotypic swaying you often see in, in captive animals, in, in zoo elephants. Has anybody seen this in video or other form before? This is interesting with Mario because he was never in captivity. He never um, went to the camps, but what happened was his family was disrupted very early. His mom was sent to the camps. And it was traumatic for him. And so when he returned to this forest with his cousins, he displayed this behavior fairly frequently and for fairly long durations. That is no longer the case. He does it a little bit when he's frustrated, a little bit when he has to make a decision he's uncomfortable with, but for the most part, that behavior is gone because he's had the time to gain experience in the forest, confidence, he has the buffering, the support of his family. And so here's Mario today enjoying a bath. This was from actually a year ago, but it's a beautiful photo. So we ask for elephants, for animals like Mario, like Tonkam, like Bifern, like Sunti, what does it mean to be wild? What is wild then in this world where a wilderness doesn't exist in the way that we once hoped or thought it did? So what is at the heart of being wild for the elephants themselves? is what we ask and what compassionate conservation asks. So why do we privilege this notion of wild? And why is re the notion of rewilding so important? It's because I think that it means some notion of autonomy, some type of choice, a level of agency in your own life, a sense of dignity, and the opportunity. The opportunity for those positive emotions, for those challenges, the opportunity to make mistakes and to recover from that, to grow resilience, the ability for the opportunity to cope. So wild is choice. It's access to a range of those challenges, its relationships, and its emotions. So compassionate conservation, and we ask in my program here with the Asian elephants, is how do we return the power of being wild, the autonomy, the choice, the dignity, the agency, to animals that have been stripped it, of it? Understanding that wild is no longer about status at birth, but to these life opportunities. So if you think about that continuum to a life not worth living, to a life worth living, how do we return that and give them the, the, the ability to strive towards that? This is a compassionate model, right, We're in, like I said, we're in wild belongs to life opportunities, not to this status at birth a model of elephant conservation and protection that offers this life worth living, this notion of rescuing from captivity, from constraint, from lack of choice, 
the ability to rehabilitate them, because some of them come with various forms of injury, both physical and psychological. So thinking back to the importance of wildlife rehabilitation and those caregivers that have those skills to restore these skills to these animals, the health, the confidence, et cetera, to navigate their new world, to navigate new relationships, new terrain. And then the ability and the opportunity to rewild these elephants to protective and native habitat that in Thailand in many areas actually does exist. So I want to thank you for taking the time to hear about compassionate conservation and I thank you for all the work you do in your own lives on behalf of animals. So mahalo for coming tonight. Have a safe return home. Good night everyone.